Many of you have met Douglas Mangum before. Douglas was one of our speakers, uh, Douglas, two years ago or three? Three years ago? Three years ago when uh, Roger Moore and Douglas and their associates did the amazing archaeological investigation of the Almonte Surrender Site uh, in the NRG property near the existing uh, uh, National uh, State Historic Site. Um, finding the exact location where Colonel Juan, Al Juan Nepomuceno Almonte uh, brought his troops together, lined them up, asked them to drop their weapons and bayonets and ammunition and, as it turns out, silver coins and other things, and marched them rank and file up to the Texans to surrender them, thus saving their lives. We had verbal descriptions of that, but until uh, Roger and Douglas did their archaeology, we didn't know where it was or exactly how it had happened. Um, Douglas Mangum is uh, the principal investigator, historian, and geographic information systems manager at Moore Archaeological Consulting here in Houston. Uh, he manages all kinds of archaeological investigations, especially those at the San Jacinto Battleground. Uh, he does computer mapping, uh, creating databases that are so valuable in keeping track of material and locating the discovery of new materials. Uh, his study of artifacts and historical evidence is going to be uh, appearing in a chapter of the book, The Archaeology of Engagement in North America, to be published this year by the Texas A&M University Press. There is a link between archaeology and preservation, as Kristen made very clear today and by her very presence here. Uh, a link between archaeology, preservation, and interpretation, knowing what happened, when, and where, and how, and how it very often varies from the accepted legends, the accepted monuments, the accepted commemorative uh, statues, sometimes these things are not exactly in the right place and sometimes don't even tell the story that the archaeology reveals. Uh, Douglas has assured me that um, he will speak for no more than 40 minutes. That was his decision, not ours. We did not do that to him. But what that means is that by about 345, uh, we'll take a short break. I want you, if you have written questions, to give them to me during that time. And then immediately after the break, we will impanel uh, our speakers, plus uh, uh, Jan DeVault, Greg Demick, and David Pomeroy. And we will endeavor, after a few brief statements, to answer your questions. Uh, please welcome Douglas Mangum. Thank you, Jim. Uh, appreciate the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope it'll warm up a little at some point. I want to thank the San Jacinto Battleground Conservancy for inviting me to speak here uh, this afternoon. It's always a privilege and, uh, and a pleasure to participate in this symposium uh, from year to year. I think this is my 10th, 8th, uh, 8th or 9th. Um, the continuing effort to learn more about the Battle of San Jacinto and to preserve the battlefield owes a lot to these symposia and the people who have organized them for the last dozen years. My topic this afternoon is the uh, archaeology of the Battle of San Jacinto, what has been done, what is being done right now, and what we and others hope to do, and also what this means to our understanding of the battle, uh, the Texas Revolution as a whole, and the people who fought on both sides of the conflict. As I sat down to prepare this presentation, I knew that uh, I was looking at a pretty daunting task because we have eight years of archaeology uh, to, to try and compress and, and discuss. Uh, limiting myself just to projects that, that more archaeological consulting has been involved in, uh, we've, we've been involved in nearly 20 projects of, of one level or another over the last eight years uh, in and around the state site. We've examined uh, land in an area more than three miles across, uh, in involving hundreds of acres of, of ground actually covered, walked across, dug holes in. We've dug, we've dug and refilled 
probably tens of thousands of, of small holes, uh, removed thousands of pull tabs, aluminum cans, and other bits of modern trash from the, the state site and, and other areas around the site. We've learned more about the soils at the battlefield than, than most of us on the staff know about uh, the back of our own hands, uh, just by virtue of having put our hands in the soil so often. Uh, we've also examined thousands of historical documents, images, and maps, as well as modern texts and websites in our pursuit of better understanding of what we've found and what it means. Um, we've recovered more than 1,500 artifacts related to the battle, uh, many more that are, that are historic items that we're not certain of, of whether they're battle-related or not. And we've been lucky enough to be part of locating lost elements of, of the battle. As, as Jim mentioned, the, the surrender site was a, a very pleasant surprise to us. Um, and in doing that, we've had a chance to rewrite uh, small bits of, of the history of the battle. These experiences, combined with the findings of other archaeologists in the San Jacinto area, have allowed us to develop an imperfect but ever-improving understanding of the battlefield. But it's also taught us that there is always much, much more to learn. Uh, every, every step we take, it seems like there, there are a dozen more that need to be taken. And that, to me, is, is sort of the take-home lesson of the archaeology. Uh, you can dig lots of holes, but you've still got a lot more to dig. So this is, this is just a short list, well actually it's the complete list, sorry, of, of the projects that we've been on, involved in. I'd originally planned on doing it as just the short list, but uh, you know, it looks like a lot, uh, but uh, you'll, I'll just go ahead and show you my map. Um, these are the areas that we've covered in, in the state site and in the, in the area around the state site, and yet you can see that there is, is a lot of area yet to, be, yet to be covered, yet to be looked at. And some of the areas uh, shown on this map are imperfectly covered uh, so far. We've, we've uh, examined them, but not to the extent that we'd like to. And just going back to the list real quick, I'll, I'll mention a couple of the, the more high points. Uh, our work in the Mexican uh, camp uh, area has yielded hundreds and hundreds of artifacts and a pretty good understanding of what was going on in the in the main camp area during the main main part of the conflict but it's also shown us that that there's a lot yet to be to, to be found um, the Peggy Lake investigations and the NRG work uh, revealing the the retreat of the Mexicans and their surrender site uh, also worked during the visitor center investigations uh, where we expanded the, the, the breadth of the April 20th cavalry skirmish. And then you see that there's quite a, quite a large number of other projects as well. Um, actually on the lower left, I'm particularly proud of our involvement uh, doing uh, isotopic analysis of some of the lead artifacts. Uh, this has allowed us to source artifacts to particular areas in Mexico or particular areas on the Mississippi River Valley, which were the two main sources for lead in, the, in North America at the time. And that's helped us a lot in determining uh, which musket balls, for instance, came from, from Mexican guns and which came from Texans. And uh, just before I go on to a, a brief review of the artifacts, everybody who's spoken so far has mentioned how lucky they are. And I just wanted to point out, uh, when we were working in the Mexican camp area our first, first season, it was just sort of a fluke that uh, one of the days that we were there was also a day when the History Channel was filming reenactment whoops, of the battle. And uh, they, they couldn't do it in the Mexican camp where they wanted to because we were there. So they had to do it just, just over, over the hill. And uh, so we, we, spent the day, we spent the day digging up musket balls while listening to the sound of, of musketry and the occasional cannon shot uh, just over the hill. And you, you, you talk about very often when, when we're out there digging, we, uh, on any kind of site, 
uh, you, you sort of feel the echoes of history uh, walking up and down on your spine. And this was a case when they were literally impinging on our eardrums all day long. And uh, as you would suspect by the fact that I'm saying all day long, their battle of San Jacinto lasted significantly longer than 18 minutes. Uh, I think they probably expended more powder in, in the, the day that they were out there than, than the Texan army did all day long at San Jacinto, or both sides all day long. Um, but that was when I realized that this was a special project, uh, that this wasn't just another archeological investigation. This was, this was the history of Texas, my home state. And it was, it was something very important. And it, it, that moment has always sort of lingered with me whenever we go back out there. So I just sort of wanted to uh, follow the, the, the process of everybody seeming to th say how lucky they are to get to do what they're doing. And then uh, we have found, as I said, a, a something over uh, 1,500 artifacts over the years. And those are generally broken up into a, a, a number of categories. Uh, most common are munitions. And this is the cannon and, and musketry and rifle pistol shot from both sides. Uh, what you see here are, are Texas cannon uh, artifacts. These are Mexican cannon artifacts. And then these are, are musket balls, rifle balls, pistol balls, buckshot. Um, they include two examples uh, of muskets that uh, went through somebody, probably. Uh, it's possible that they went through an animal, but probably through a, a person taking small bits of the bone embedded in the lead, and if you've ever seen CSI enough to know where they have those little CSI moments where the bullet travels through, when we first realized that we, we had these, uh, we, we all, I think, had moments like that. When you say, Roger? <laughs> A second fairly common uh, category is gun parts and tools. Um, these are all uh, various and sundry uh, uh, parts from brown best muskets and other muskets and rifles, um, and uh, including a gun flint. We're not certain that the gun flint is, is a period. It's possible it's from a reenactor, but I've included it there, here just to, to show you. Um, ramrods and gun tools, including uh, one of my favorites, uh, David Pomeroy, uh, this, that one, uh, I was walking around with it in a bag, properly conserved, ready, ready to go, uh, at one of our first symposia, and I was asking people if they had seen anything like it, and I showed, showed it to David Pomeroy, who that day was in, in full Texan army kit, and he looked at it and said, oh, you mean like this? And pulled out his gun tool, uh, which looked exactly like an unbroken version of this. And, and that was uh, not our first instance of knowing that the reenactors were a great source, but it was, it was certainly one of the highlight moments. And then, of course, bayonets, including the one in the, that you see in the ground was our very first one, which uh, mythology says was the very same, we found that the very same day as that reenactment uh, was going on on the other side of the hill, but uh, I think that's myth, but still, it was it was one of those exciting moments when uh, you feel your blood start to pump, even though you're doing something slow and cautious. Then uh, we have a small number of cavalry or or equine related artifacts, uh, horseshoe and uh, either a mule or an ox shoe, uh, various bits of harness, including a, a wonderful bronze stirrup. Uh, broken that was found in the Texan camp area. The, uh, the ring and the, whoops. The ring and the small rivet in the lower right were found out in the area of the cavalry skirmish and they were found pretty much as far as archeology span is concerned together within less than a yard of one another and we tend to think that it was probably an instance of, uh, it's, it's one of those large uh, stirrup, I mean not stirrup, one of the large belly strap type rings, we tend to think that that was where uh, somebody lost a saddle, maybe was thrown off their horse. Uh, the rivet gave, the ring popped out, 
saddle would have, would have gone away and somebody falls off their horse. Um, we'd love to tie it to certain particular instances from the historic record of, of that sort of thing happening during the cavalry skirmish, but we don't usually get to make those sort of inferences except that the Almonte surrender site. And then uh, spurs. Um, I think we have a total of five, and this is three of them. One of, one of them has been through conservation, the other two are pre-conservation. And then uniform artifacts, buttons, uh, various buckles and uniform connectors. The, the thing with the hook, right there is a, a sword hook for, that a cavalry or officer uh, soldier would use to lift their sword normally hanging low when they're on, on the saddle up onto their belt so that it doesn't drag the ground. Various uniform decorations. Uniform decorations that uh, specify type of unit or in the case of the BGO plate and also the Shaco plate specific units, uh, the Battalion Guerrero in that case. And then uh, actually uh, some pieces of uniform themselves, very small swatches of cloth and some threads. Uh, unfortunately, that sort of find has been extremely rare, but uh, it's, it's been pretty incredible to find them. And then personal items, uh, there are forks and knives and spoons, uh, little pocket knives. These two pocket knives were found uh, more than a mile apart in two different areas of the state site and outside the state site, but when we looked at them together, we realized that they were the same, and they were probably issue to the Mexican army, uh, just made at the same place, made exactly the same way, and handed out as a standard tool. So finding that in two separate locations was pretty incredible. And then a very small amount of coinage, including uh, the very strange piece you see at the top middle, which is a, a bronze Roman coin that we think was uh, probably somebody's uh, personal lucky piece worn around their neck. And then a, a small number of unknowns. There's some, the, on the lower left is bronze strapping that could be from a canteen or some similar uh, piece of equipment. And then uh, uh, the bronze plate on the right, I mean, pardon me, copper plate on the right, uh, it's probably not actually related to the battle. We're not absolutely sur sure. Uh, it may be Native American, which highlights the fact that this site also has a lot of Native American sites on it, as well as, as the battle and the his other historic uh, sites. So having shown you all of these artifacts, all the pretties, um, the real question, uh, that comes to us after we get back to the lab and start doing analysis is, what does it all mean? Uh, what does it tell us and how does it help us better understand the battle and the people who participated in it? And how can it help us better preserve, preserve the battlefield? There have been small lessons that have come from the archeology span and great lessons as well. Um, among the small ones are that uh, we've been able to show, at least in certain areas of the park, where soil has been deposited atop the, the original landscape um, as it would have been in 1836. Uh, we've also been able to show areas where there's been, where there's obviously been intensive uh, collecting, undocumented collecting, and uh, places where the, the soil has been scraped away and, and left no artifacts next to an area that's a dense concentration of artifacts. Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, we've, we've also expanded the, the locale of the April 20th Cavalry Skirmish, and that didn't really surprise us too much. You, you don't expect that just because there's a marker saying here's where the Cavalry Skirmish happened that it all happened within 20 yards of that. This is a very fluid battle, uh, a lot going on, and it just simply spread much farther than, than uh, could be recorded at the time that those markers were, were set out. We also found a late 19th century or early 20th century historic site plopped right in the middle of the Texan camp, which uh, you can imagine how that can complicate the interpretation of, of what, we've, what we've been doing in the Texan camp. And we've had to sort of get pretty good at filtering out uh, other historic elements from the battle. Oops, sorry. 
and, and in the process of the last eight years, we've, we've gotten a lot better at what we do. When we first started, we were, we were not conflict archaeologists. We weren't battlefield archaeologists. We had plenty of experience, but uh, not so much in battlefield itself. But we listened to other archaeologists. We learned a lot from what we've done. We made eh, a few mistakes on the way, but nothing major. And we learned from those. And it's, it's gotten much, much better. But then the, the big lessons, the places where we've sort of changed the story, um, a big one for me, I, I, we have, we're pretty certain that the Mexican camp is not, was not directly behind the breastworks. Uh, this is, uh, there are those who argue it, but uh, we, we believe we've done enough work in the area behind the breastworks and not found camp goods, or very, very little. And this is a camp that was run over by, by, its, by the enemy. The, the Texans were running after the Mexicans. The Mexicans would have run through their own camp. The Texans would have chased after them. There would have been a lot of our artifacts pushed into the ground, and we should have found them, and we haven't. What we find is a scattering of dropped musket balls, uniform bits and pieces. Uh, that tells us that, that this is a part of the retreat, but not the camp. So that's something to continue looking for. We also feel fairly strongly, as strongly as archaeologists ever get to, to say they are, that the twin sisters were six-pounder cannon. And that's, that's been debated for a long time. The, the, the historic record is mixed, but we have found four different solid, of, I believe, fairly incontrovertible pieces of evidence in the ground, right in the Mexican camp area, the main conflict area, that pretty much just tell us they were six-pounders. So we feel that we've put that behind us. And though I know at least Greg will, will d disagree with me, and understandably so, considering where his research has led him, uh, I think that the archaeology suggests, again, just suggests, that the golden standard, the Mexican cannon, was either an 8, 9, or a 12-pounder cannon, which, while that's still pretty generalized, at least narrows it down a bit. We've also found Mexican canister shot both in the, in the prairie area south of, of the, the old limits of the state site and in the main park. And I know I shouldn't have said park. Sorry, Michael. Uh, the state site. And uh, that pretty much has confirmed for us that uh, the historic accounts that talk about the Mexican cannon firing first at the Texas cavalry that was displaying off on, on the Mexican left first, and then turning their cannon towards the, the infantry belatedly, um, that those are true. And we think that that actually suggests why the, the Texas casualty rate was so low. We've also located uh, evidence of the Mexican retreat along Peggy Lake, and also obviously all the talk about the NRG site, uh, the site of what is at least a major surrender uh, locale of, of the Mexican army. Uh, Michael sometimes debates with us whether it's Almonte's surrender site definitively or not, uh, and I'm willing to, to agree that there's, there's always the possibility it's not, but Occam's razor sort of tells us that that was the largest recorded uh, single surrender of Mexicans, and this was a large surrender of Mexicans. It's probably the, the Almonte site. We've conclus conclusively shown that the Texans were using expedient canister shot in addition to the formal canister shot that they got with the cannon. And, and we do believe that they did get shot along with the cannon when they came. Um, this, uh, this expedient canister shot was probably made at Gross's plantation while the, while the army was organizing itself. There are some historical accounts that suggest as much and we're in the process of using lead isotope analysis to try and uh, at least get close to a confirmation of that. But this, this may actually be the source of the chopped up horseshoe story. We, we think that uh, somebody may have uh, taken that story ha having seen chopping up of bar lead to make into expedient canister shot that it, over time it sort of morphed into chopping up horseshoes, which. I don't know if you've ever tried to chop lead versus chopping iron, but uh, 
one is much easier than the other. And it may also be why a lot of, of Texan accounts talk about uh, them having fired both canister and grape shot. Uh, they may have been calling the formal canister shot grape and this expedient chopped up stuff uh, canister shot. And uh, then as a result of this, uh, we've been able to uh, make our own recommendations uh, for a sizable expansion to the National Register of Historic uh, Places boundary for the state, for the site. Um, the current boundaries are based on the, the limits of the park as it was, uh, it was in the 1960s, wasn't it, Michael, when that originally register? 75. Uh, at which time the, the state site, and I think at that time it actually was called a park uh, still, uh, was, was considerably smaller and uh, our, our recommendations actually expand beyond the boundaries of the state site anyway. So the work we've done has also allowed us to identify a patterning of artifacts both on a small and a large scale. On a small scale, uh, almost uh, often individual scale, uh, we've seen, we've found in place a uh, buck and ball shot, uh, which some of you are familiar with, it's, uh, but some of you may not be. So it's basically they would add buck shot to their, to their musket ball when they loaded their, their muskets to have a better chance of hitting somebody. We actually found these three buck shot uh, right with this musket ball. And then also in the Mexican camp, we were able, with uh, Dr. Doug Scott's ha help, to identify uh, multiple musket balls that matched one another in, in mold seams, uh, indicating that they had, many of them had been made from the same mold. And that would suggest either that the Mexican troops were making their own musket balls by unit, or possibly that uh, a lot of these musket balls had came from the same manufactory back in Mexico. Uh, this one, I, I, when, when we found this, uh, I'll just tell you, it's, it's a split musket ball. It, it, but we found both pieces, and we found them very close to one another. I think it ended up being uh, less than a meter apart. And the only thing that could cause that sort of splitting would have been a very high speed impact on some sort of surface that had an edge, um, possibly a bayonet or a sword or a knife, um, possibly a sharp piece on somebody, uh, something that had something of an edge on, on somebody's uniform. But probably it, it did that, split, and then hit the person who is holding it. Because otherwise, uh, I would think this high impact splitting the ball apart, the ball would have fl flown significantly apart. So this. This, along with the balls that have bone in them, very much humanizes this battle. It wasn't some you know, cold Hollywood uh, movie from the 50s where you get shot, but there's no blood. This was bloody work. And then, if I can, uh, we also found, uh, I believe it was ended up being half a dozen of these D8 or DS buttons. Greg and I are still, have been going back and forth on whether it's D8 or DS. But either way, it's a Dragoon uniform uh, button. And we found them all close together, which suggests that somebody made it as far, in this case, as the, the surrender site, still wearing their tunic, and then took it off as a part of preparing to surrender. They didn't want to be identified as one of the units, perhaps, that had been at, at, at the Alamo, so they took off anything that identified them as such and, and uh, then walked out. Well, it's, <laughs> I don't know, but, uh, whoops. Then we also have uh, large scale patterns uh, on a much broader scale. And these are the, the Mexican artillery and the Texan artillery artifacts that we found. Uh, they are actually suggesting to us the tactics that were used, the difference in the tactics that were used by the artillery of both sides. And uh, then, uh, the upper one is, is actually a cone of, uh, an estimated cone of fire from the Mexicans, and the, the lower one is uh, from the Texas cannon. And then obviously the surrender site itself. Uh, 
we found this long line of artifacts. It was long, I believe it ended up being 180 meters long and only about 20 meters wide with only a few outliers. What would cause that? Well, we've, we finally got a very good geo-referenced version of a 1930 aerial photograph, which is what you see these artifacts laid out on, and you can see that they pretty much follow the old tree line. We believe that the, the little crescent cut out of the, the, the middle of this line was probably caused by the locals simply cutting trees for themselves, but the, the, the confluence of this line of artifacts and the tree line is just hard to miss once you have the right right information sitting in front of you. And then, uh, again, personalizing things, we've, we've been able to at least infer both group and individual behaviors. Uh, group would include a large-scale dropping of the musket balls. Uh, any battlefield of this era, you're going to find a lot of drop musket balls as people panic or, or screw up while they're loading and drop one or two. Here it's uh, anywhere from 90 to 98 percent of, of the balls, depending on the area we're in, are dropped as opposed to fired. And uh, in the case of the, the surrender site, um, they're all in a line along the tree line. They were intentionally dropped, but also in the, the, main, in the main state site, in the main combat area, uh, we still have lots and lots of these dropped balls, and we think that this was a more a process of the Mexican panic and also the Texans uh, just racing after them. There was a lot of, uh, lot of droppage. And then uh, another item that kind of surprised us was that at the surrender site, we found one group of bayonets, uh, five bayonets all within just a few meters of one another. It's this little cluster right there. And we think that, that Probably when they were in garrison and they were being disarmed for garrison duty, it was standard to, to drop your, you know, set your musket down, but probably drop your, your bayonets in a pile. And we think that probably a small group of, of men from the same unit were following their, their habit. Then on an individual basis, uh, again, talking about dropping of, of, of musket balls, but on, a per, on an individual level, we found many of these clusters of musket balls. Uh, this one is, is the, the most extreme. I believe uh, it actually ended up having 27. There are 23 or 24 in this picture, all in a tight cluster that pretty strongly indicated that somebody just dropped them or emptied out their, their bag uh, we've found, this is the extreme one, but we've found many that are uh, 5, 8, 10, 12 shot. And uh, we think that you would find dropped ones individually if, if it was accidental, but these are, seem to be indications of an individual dropping their entire bag or pouring it out. And then uh, while I don't have a picture or, or clear proof of this, we do think that we've found evidence of of people firing their, their, bay, their ramrods. This is something that sometimes happened in battle when a soldier got too panicked to finish the process and fired their musket while the ramrod was still inside and it travels out and can kill or wound people or just hit the ground. We found two that uh, I tend to think uh, that is what happened. And uh, this isn't an individual behavior or group behavior, but uh, it's, it's more discussion of what all of these finds, all of these uh, behavioral uh, determinations and group uh, tactics and such. What it's told us is, is that it's, it's very important that these artifacts be found and recorded in a very controlled way. In our case, we're using a total station. That's the tripod-mounted uh, piece of equipment. And that gets us uh, usually pretty close to centimeter level of accuracy of where the artifacts are. And it's the fact that the, the musket ball, the buck and ball shot, the musket ball of that group was found in 2008. The buck shot were found in 2009. But I was able in, in the GIS world to take those two uh, sets and put them together and see that they were right next to each other. And the only reason they weren't found in 2008 was 
we didn't have the right kind of machine to, to find those smaller bits of, of lead. We've also been able to identify differences uh, in the technological levels of both sides, or at least indications of, of the technological levels of one side or the other. Um, oops. For instance, there does seem to have been some use of limited use of percussion cap weaponry at San Jacinto, and we've long suspected that that was the case since uh, that sort of weaponry was available um, at the time. It had been available for, for quite some time, uh, and we had found percussion caps before. We just weren't certain, but it's, we're getting closer to, to proving that. We've also seen uh, differences in the technology that was used uh, by the artilleries of the two sides, as well as tactics. And what we see is that the Mexicans were using a very distinctively older style of canister shot, which is simply a, a, a tinned iron can with a wooden uh, plug or sabot, and they were using copper for their shot. Um, Thankfully, that makes it very easy for us to define what is Texan shot versus uh, Mexican shot. Whereas the, the Texans on the other side were using both a very modern and a, and a much older technology at the same time. The, the canister shot that they received along with the cannon had been manufactured probably in Cincinnati and was a tin can. You can see the, the image here on the right, it, unfortunately, on the screen it blurs badly and I apologize for that, but it's, a, it's the same general design as the Mexican, but it uses an iron plate at the bottom and an iron plate at the top, which imparts more uh, velocity to the shot. It also means that we end up finding these, these canister plates in, in, the, in the battlefield area with dimples from those shots pressing against them as, as the shot is fired. Uh, leaving permanent impressions. But then they also had the, the expedient canister shot that I mentioned earlier, and that's these lead ingots simply uh, wrapped, in a, wrapped tightly in a, in a bag, probably put on top of that other canister uh, to get extra impact when they were at short range, which is why we find this uh, in, in, the, in the area of where we have long expected we should find the, the Mexican breastworks. And then uh, this is on both sides, this is just an indication of, of what uh, cloth manufacturing was like in Mexico at the time, at least for, for uniforms. On the left, you see uh, linen swatches. Uh, we're leaning now towards thinking that this was part of a Shaco cover. Uh, the, the Mexican troops were very Napoleonic in their, their gear, at least the, the permanent units and uh, you would often have a cover to protect your shako when it wasn't, when you weren't knowingly marching into battle. And then on the right, uh, uh, some small cotton threads and these are both being analyzed by, uh, I forget what uh, she calls herself, a uh, textile anthropologist. So, um, having talked about the past and the, the present, uh, it's time to talk about the future a little. Uh, some of the future and what we hope the future brings is about pure and simple dirt archaeology, more projects. But other things are less directly about the archaeology, uh, but are still related. Uh, the most obvious elements of the future are, are the projects that we anticipate doing. Uh, among these are more work on the prairie restoration. We had actually gotten started on that, but all the rain this winter uh, combined with uh, the fact that the, the rain had prevented uh, mowing from happening uh, meant we had to stall it out. Hopefully it'll start up again fairly soon. The Conservancy uh, wants us to take a look at their, the O'Quinn property when, when it's time, and uh, then we also anticipate some additional work in the Texan camp. Uh, the details on that are still being worked out. And then sort of our bucket list, wish list of what we'd like to do, things that we have theories about, um, but would like to test out our more work around the surrender site. Uh, we do not believe we found everything just because we found a dense cluster of artifacts and not much around it doesn't mean to us that we've found everything. So we think that there's more there. Uh, 
We've long wanted to continue work in the Mexican camp, looking for the actual camp and trying to identify the line of the breastworks. Uh, as much work as we've done that in that area, we, we simply have not found it yet. And then also, we believe that the, it would be a very worthwhile project to look for evidence of the cannon duel from April the 20th. The, the cannons of the two sides fired at each other for something like two, maybe three hours. And there should be a considerable number of, of munitions on both sides from, uh, from the, all that firing. Uh, but we just haven't had a chance to do that yet. And then related to archaeology is, uh, as, as Jim mentioned earlier, I have a chapter, uh, but Michael also has a chapter, uh, Roger has a chapter, and uh, I and, and Peter Price, who, who is our GIS consultant, have a chapter, and then there are a couple of others as well. A total of six chapters uh, about San Jacinto in the book that's coming out. And uh, it's as, about as close as, as we're going to come in the near future to a book about Texas, uh, about San Jacinto archaeology. Uh, and it's actually expected to be released sometime in early 2013. Uh, we're also uh, hoping, uh, almost expecting, to, to get to do an omnibus report covering all of the archaeology work that's been done so far that hasn't been reported on yet in the, in the state site. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're working on some more of the lead isotope sourcing, and we're anticipating writing an article with the, the, um, Dr. Ketterer, who is doing the actual uh, sourcing for us. And then, sort of out there on the horizon, uh, a personal pet project of mine that's been in the planning for a long time but has been waiting for uh, funding is a canister shot experiment. Uh, where we anticipate uh, shooting canister shot, modern, uh, modern rebuild of canister shot as it was at the time, um, but being able to go and collect that shot and the parts of the shot out on, on the downrange and shoot every one of those in, providing a, an extremely accurate uh, uh, distribution mapping of how those shot would fall, how the parts would fall, which will allow us to go back to San Jacinto and look at what we have found so far and better estimate where those cannon were when they fired and what the behavior indicates. Um, what you're seeing, the, the film that you're seeing, Dr. Doug Scott uh, did do a cancer experiment, but it was at Yuma Proving Grounds, uh, the U.S. Army's Yuma Proving Grounds. And unfortunately, because it's a proving ground that uses live ammunition much of the time, they were only allowed to do filming and target uh, placement. They weren't allowed to go and collect the shot afterwards. So, but this gives you an idea of how much fun the, the experiment will be, as well as, as, uh, as well as being potentially very helpful, not only to uh, us at San Jacinto, but to archaeologists uh, in conflict archaeology uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. I've had ex uh, excitement expressed to me from uh, archaeologists uh, at a conference we went to in Leeds, England about, about doing this. They think it would be very worthwhile. Um, so, funding. <laughs> Jan will tell me to shut up after this. But. And then uh, another out there thing that uh, I think could be done relatively easy, easily is virtual landscape recreation. We are never in our life's, uh, lifetime going to see the, the, the San Jacinto Monument removed. Uh, we may not see the, the, the reflecting pool removed or filled in. Even if we could get all of that, the, the truth is deflation and, and subsidence of the soil out at San Jacinto has dropped the landscape by 10 to 12 feet. And as Michael mentioned, lost us hundreds of, probably hundreds of acres of, of the battlefield along the edges, mind you. But that's not going to go away. That, that's not going to change. We're not going to see the battlefield in, in the real world the way it was in 1836. But what we do have is LIDAR maps, modern topographic maps, historic maps, and the archaeology that we could put all together and create in the virtual world a very accurate, very 
uh, authentic looking within certain limits, recreation of what the battlefield did, looked like. And as you can see in this Pompeii exhibit uh, of, of the same idea, be able to walk across the battlefield. Um, those of you who have done any sort of work in GIS or just played around with Google Earth know that uh, there are all sorts of manipulations you can do flying over a, a landscape. We could do this very easily for San Jacinto and give everyone within a year or two the ability to see what the landscape really looked like. And you could even insert little men walking along and at, or place them at different points in the battle to give people a very realistic uh, recreation of the battle. And then uh, Roger and I are still hoping at some point to do a book that's purely San Jacinto archaeology. Uh, that might be kind of out there. It depends on how Roger and I move. And then uh, we're always looking for and experimenting uh, with new technologies or hoping that they'll come out. Uh, things that will help us improve our w methods of examining the site and, and the individual artifacts. Oops. This is, this is uh, something I pulled from a, uh, from a website that's, that's out there now. It's a, it's a new metal detector that combines uh, virtual reality goggles with a metal detector and claims to be able to allow you to see what it is under the ground before, before you dig. And you know, you can look at that and kind of laugh, but the truth is that's, that's probably, even if this version doesn't work, it's, it's out there. It's going to happen. Somebody will create the technology. We're also hoping for improved software for post-processing of uh, such tools as the EM63 machine, magnetometers, and ground-penetrating radar. Uh, this is, this is uh, Dr. Mark Everett from Texas A&M walking his EM-63 machine over the battlefield. Turns out this machine is incredibly good at, at, at finding unexploded ordnance and, and buried, uh, buried architecture. Not so good at finding individual musket balls. It can actually be rolled directly over a musket ball and not find it. But he believes, and, and we tend to believe him, that uh, given improvements in both the hardware and the software that someday that will it will be possible. And then we'd like to, to use more uh, uh, electron microscopy to get details out of some of the artifacts. This is an electron microscope image and also X-ray uh, spectrometry results uh, from that mass of, of lead ingots that I showed you earlier. And this is where we were able to see that uh, there are small flecks of iron embedded on, on that that are probably representative of either uh, the can that they were placed in or, or flecks of metal from the inside of the cannon barrel itself as, as they passed out of the barrel, they picked it up. And then uh, future technologies, anything from Indiana Jones's laser, laser amulet to uh, spacesuits, who knows? Who knows what's out there, but the fact is Archaeology has already changed so much in the last 20, 20 plus years. Uh, who knows what another 20 years we'll see and what it'll let us do out on the battlefield. And uh, here's where I'd normally put in conclusions, but the, the truth is I think I've already told you all of my conclusions, so I'll save the time and just move on to acknowledgments. Uh, it's very important to, to stress the fact that uh, when I say we, I, I don't mean more archaeological consulting at least not us alone. We have done uh, a good bit of the work, we've done a good bit of the physical work, but none of this could have been possible without the, the individuals and groups that helped us all along the way. Uh, literally hundreds of people spending you know, thousands of hours of their own time to come and help us, and we simply couldn't have done it without, a, without, without them. We also could not have done it without folks like the, the Conservancy. Parks and Wildlife, the Historical Commission. These, these people are incredible and they've, they've supported us in, in so many ways. And then also there are some of our, our interdisciplinary team scientists who have helped us an awful lot and I wanna thank them all. And then I'd like to thank you for, for listening. Thank you.
Thank you, Douglas. Uh, I have a question for Douglas, but I'm not going to ask it now because you'd get mad. Uh, we're going to meet back here at exactly 4 o'clock. We'll have our panel in panel. So if you're a speaker or David Pomeroy or Jan DeVault or Greg Dimmick, you need to come up here before 4 o'clock. And we'll start again then. Please. I need a quick answer to this question. Can someone expand on who owns, runs, controls the Alamo? Thanks. Paul? Who owns, runs, or controls the Alamo now? We heard something briefly about that. There's new information. Yes. Uh, well, the state of Texas owns the Alamo. And um, who actually controls it, I believe, right now is in a state of flux. And so... Uh, Someone said today the general land office has been given oversight. Is that correct? Uh, that's what I was. That's what I've been to told in this late in this latest dust up, uh, just in terms of administrative oversight. But the daughters still run. The daughters the still day, run the day -day day Alamo. Operation. But there is now state oversight in a way that there wasn't a year or two ago. Who would you contact? to do volunteer archaeology? If, you, if, 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 if there are volunteers, who, would, who should they contact? Um, if you want to work as a park volunteer, Beth Tragus at the San Jacinto uh, Battlefield, Battleground State Historic Site. Uh, she is the volunteer coordinator. Uh, the, the tricky thing is that our projects are intermittent and um, so it's very difficult for me to keep track of all of the people who want to, to volunteer, so I usually uh, defer to other coordinators. I would suggest contacting Jan DeVall. We have a archaeology committee that runs, and uh, Jan coordinate, and she'll know what projects are out Jeff, there. Jeff, use the good mic, please. She'll know what projects are out there at any one particular time, and can coordinate with the volunteers. Have any ceramic chards been found on the San Jacinto battleground? If so, what are they? Ceramic chards. Like a pot chard, ceramic chards. No. That was good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, where, since we're looking for metal artifacts with, with metal detectors, the only reason that we've found uh, other items, non-metallic items, is when they are in immediate proximity with, with a metal artifact. So we've found uh, two flints, and we've found those pieces of cloth. Those pieces of cloth we only found because they were actually twisted in with pieces of copper, which is why they were preserved at all. So uh, we would love to find some non-metal artifacts, but we haven't yet. Dr. Hutton, would you please tell us again what date the hump was added to the Alamo? Oh, the hump was added to the Alamo, uh, I believe, 1849, if, I'm, if my memory is serving me. 49, 49 or 50. I think there's, a, there's, 50, there's an yeah. existing photograph, the earliest photograph known to be taken in Texas which is of the Alamo before the hump was added, and I believe that's an 1849 photograph. I think that's that correct. could be, yeah, could, that could it's, be a 49 It's now owned photo. by the Center for American History, what used to be the Barker Texas History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Here was another question for Dr. Hutton, which I'm not going to let him answer. Uh, what evidence is, uh, is there that suggests Davy Crockett was captured and executed? Um, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exert a privilege here and, and recommend that you read uh, two things that I wrote. <laughs> One is an, is an examination of the best evidence there is, and that's the Dolson letter. You can find this in the Journal of the West uh, historical magazine, the Journal of the West, published in the spring of 2007. Um, and it goes through that letter very carefully. Dolson was a bilingual Texan sergeant at the Mexican prisoner of war camp on Galveston Island. The other is a little book that came out recently. The first half of it 
is called How Did Davy Die? and was written by Dan Kilgore back in 1978, published in 78. The second, which the uh, publishers gave, not me, is called Why Do We Care So Much? My subtitle would have been How Do We Know? And what I do there is to go through the Kilgore book, chapter and verse, adding some material, uh, and showing that Dan Kilgore almost certainly had it right in 1977 and 78, when he argued that Della Pena's description of the capture and execution of Crockett was almost certainly correct. Paul, would you like to add to that, please? I just love your book. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, I keep it under my pillow. Seriously, Dan Kilgore, former president of the Texas State Historical Association, certified public accountant in Corpus Christi, was just a crackerjack historian. The only reason I would call him, call him an amateur historian is because the etymology of that word is someone who loves his subject. And Dan Kilgore loved his subject, and he was a very, very good amateur historian. Um, Kristen McMaster said uh, that the... A-B-P-P-I-N-P-S, I don't know if she said that or not, uh, works with, uh, with battles fought on American soil. If soil wasn't American when the battle was fought, would San Jacinto Battleground fall under your purview? Um, no. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of great battles that we cannot look at. We, we can't do Point de Hoc, even though we have a cemetery there and a monuments commission. It's not considered American soil, and so Congress prohibits us from working there. Um, there are some Pacific battles that are not American soil, so we're prohibited from going there or going to Nagasaki. Um, but it has to be American at the time of the battle? No, it has to be American an American now. soil now. That's what we thought. So San Jacinto does fall under it. It does fall okay. under because we're a program for domestic assistance. So I can even go into Micronesia and I can go to Palau, which I have projects there in Saipan. What this means is that the Republic of Texas is no more. <laughs> Ouch. Anson Jones said it before I did. What evidence do you have, uh, Douglas, that convinces you that the twin sisters were six-pounders? We have found three, canister, three of those canister plates, all of which I showed you, um, all of which have dimples indicating that they were fired. And before they went to conservation, at which pro Point they lost a lot of a lot of their mass that had gone to rust. You could still see the curvature of the edges of some some portions of them. Uh, they all matched. The, they all had the same curvature, and that curvature uh, creates a radius. We we were able to estimate what the original radius of, of the plates were, and the radius of those. Uh, as canister plates would not fit inside the bore of a four, four pounder cannon and would have been too small to fit inside anything larger than a, a six pounder. So we said six pounders, they pretty much have to be six pounders. But then uh, the lead ingot mass that I showed you in one of the slides as well, um, <sighs> Initially, we, we misidentified it. It's, it's just one of those things that happened, especially since we found it our first season. Um, but when we looked at it again with, with a different mindset, we realized that it, it was part of a canister round where the lead, some of the lead had simply fused into a mass. Once we recognized that, we could see that there was a scraping along one side of that mass that showed that uh, it was traveling down the inside of the barrel of a cannon. And that curvature, if you expand it again, would only fit down the bore of a six pounder cannon. And since we've had the, some of the lead uh, ingots from within that mass uh, sourced as being from the Mississippi River Valley, Texan lead, Texan cannon, six pounder cannon, from the lead ingot mass, six-pounder cannon from the lead, I mean, from the canister bases. 
While you've got the microphone, Douglas, my question earlier was going to be whether you had found any evidence whatsoever of American as opposed to Mexican bayonets. That, that's, a, that's a tough one because we're not bayonet experts. Um, Can isotope work help on that? Well, unfortunately, uh, right now the technology is not available for iron isotope analysis. As far as we know, we've uh, Dr. Ketterer, who has done our lead isotope analysis and a small amount of copper uh, analysis, uh, has been looking into it, and so far he hasn't been able to, uh, to trace it. Besides, uh, it would have to be able to, to identify the difference between British uh, iron and, and American iron, um, and as far as I know, during that period, there was actually still a lot of overlap. But uh, the, the main problem is just uh, the bayonets are in such poor condition, even when they come out of the ground, uh, much less after they've gone through the conservation process, that uh, we don't have the expertise to identify them from markings or such. They're, somebody should go and look at them at Parks and Wildlife where they're permanently conserved uh, curated and uh, do an analysis of measurements and and see for sure whether they're brown bass. We, we tend to think from comparing what we've found to uh, some antique uh, non-collected brown bass uh, bayonets that uh, all but one probably are brown bass musket, I mean, musket bayonets, but we're not certain. The reason this question was pertinent is because we had a previous guest several years ago, speakers, the Wall Ravens from Corpus Christi, who gave us their thesis that perhaps as many as 200 American deserters uh, from Fort Jessup in Louisiana fought at the Battle of San Jacinto. There are reports of Americans with bayonets or Texans with bayonets at San Jacinto. Uh, Texan settlers did not carry bayonets. American servicemen did. Uh, and it becomes a pretty important point as to how many U.S. Army people, in or out of uniform, in or out of service, were at San Jacinto. Jim, can I add something? Certainly. Uh, a mentor of mine, a guy you know very well, told me one time, and has told this group several times, it's not always that simple. I think that was you that said it's just not that simple. One of the problems when we're doing archaeology at San Jacinto is that uh, the, the Texans had a lot of captured Mexican equipment. They captured equipment at Goliad when they captured it in 1835. They captured material at the Alamo when they captured it at 35. So some of the stuff that uh, you would claim it's Mexican, it could be uh, 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 American. And then, of course, the Texans had a hodgepodge of equipment. Uh, they, they are traditionally uh, represented as all having nice Kentucky rifles, and they were accurate. Uh, uh, marksmen, some of them were, but there were a lot of them didn't even, they struggled to find guns at all, the muskets, they were desperately short of arms. We, I know on Peggy Lake we found a side plate from an American pistol, but it had no U.S. markings, but it obviously it was American. But we haven't found a, a great deal of, of Texas gear there. Then again, other than bashing the Mexicans with their, with their guns, they weren't running and dropping stuff as much. Uh, as, the, as the Mexicans were, so we would expect to form, find more Mexican stuff there, but it's, it's a, a nice mixture. And on the other hand, the Mexicans had captured stuff from the Texans, too, because the Mexicans defeated uh, uh, Fannin at Goliad, and one of the uh, documents I found said that they were, that, that they included that, that some of the best stuff they had was what was captured at Fannin. So, so the Mexicans definitely used the Texans' gear when they captured the Fannin and at the Alamo. The, the last thing about the bayonets is we've only found one in, in the state site proper, and that was right in the main conflict area. And like Greg said, it was, it was probably, uh, that was an area where you're more likely to have panic-stricken Mexican soldiers dropping that sort of equipment. Yeah, not many All, Texans, I'm sorry, not many Texans died at the... Right. Battle, and so would not have lost their bayonets. And all of the other bayonets that we've found so far were found at the surrender site, where everything else is very consistently Mexican in nature, with the exception of, of very, I think, two uh, musket balls that are of Mississippi River Valley lead, and that may just be from the Texans encouraging them to surrender. Um, here's, uh, there are some questions about the Alamo. I'm going to give preference to questions about San Jacinto and get to the Alamo if we can. Um, with regard to recent electrical lift stations that were shown uh, today, 
at San Jacinto, should they not be reviewed by the Texas Historical Commission, the Texas Antiquities Code? If so, are not visual effects considered under that code? Anyone this want to take that? This conversation that Jeff and I were having as, uh, as we walked up here, uh, depending upon the size of the project, uh, some things get, res get reviewed by the Historical Commission, some don't. The Antiquities Code gives the Historical Commission specific review over uh, archaeological things under, under the state code and presence, absence of artifacts, that kind of thing. Uh, we found an archaeological site during that, but it was post-battle. Um, I will tell you that in-house, those things were not well liked by some of us. Uh, but also, we are a political animal, and things like that, uh, that help that site run because we need to be able to flush toilets is what those things are for. Um, I would personally prefer that they don't exist on the landscape like that, but we are at a point where toilets were not flushing or were not flushing properly, leaking, that kind of thing. Um, you know, no, I don't like them. Uh, would it be better to have them somewhere else, um, perhaps on the site? Yes, but the facilities that we currently have there, uh, the one in the parking lot uh, is the lift station for the bathroom uh, that's beside the, uh, the battleship. That building is the oldest purpose-built building in the Texas State Park system. It was built around 1910, 1911. There's been discussion of getting rid of that building, but it is the first building that we have for a, quote, park. It's, so that is problematic in and of itself, into the fact that we have a bathroom that now, by its own right, has become historic. But because it's, I, I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. But because it's historic, and it's because it's a bathroom, it has facilities that go in and come out under the ground. These, these sound like crazy things, but it's the kind of stuff that I and my staff have to deal with on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and yeah, that, that, that siding of that one in the parking lot is, is, is really poorly sited, so the engineers tried to put a fence around it and make it look a little bit better and what have you. But, um, you know, if we couldn't flush the toilets there, believe me, it would get ugly fast. We're going to go directly from flushing toilets to David Pomeroy. Uh, <laughs> sorry, David. Sir David, Ooh. I'm sorry. Uh, but David hasn't had a chance to speak, and we only have about 10 minutes left, and I thought he might have something. Uh, Just 10 minutes is all I've got? <laughs> you, and they're not all yours. Yeah. But I thought you might have something to add to what you've heard today. Well, first, I was going to mention this to Douglas, is that I understand there were a fair number of pistols, and percussion in pistols was a very popular thing at that time, so very conceivably it could have been from a pistol percussion cap, because I know there were very few rifle percussions at that particular time. Shotgun? Yeah, that would be another one. Um, there was another thought. I can't remember it right at the moment, uh, so I'll... Maybe, maybe this will jog, jog your memory. What's the evidence that the scraps of fabric that you found uh, are actual Mexican from the 1836 period? That'll be good for Douglas. <laughs> well, the, all of the cloth that was found was found at the surrender site. The, uh, the little swatches of cloth were folded, twisted in with copper, thin copper sheeting that was uh, almost certainly from a Shaco decoration or some other sort of uniform decoration. And then the, the two pieces of thread were found actually inside of the, the, the initial image of them. Also had these two little pieces of copper, a dome with a, a piece of wire running through it, and then a flat piece of, of copper with a hole through it. Those two pieces had once been together. When we found them, they were together. The dome with the, the, the wire going through the hole in the flat piece, and inside that 
was, was the thread. And so far, pretty much everything copper or bronze that we've found has, has trended towards Mexico and um, because they, they simply had so much copper uh, to make bronze and, and copper artifacts. And uh, so that, in, in combination with the context of being in the middle of the surrender site, uh, pretty strongly indicated a Mexican origin rather than Texan. Here's an Alamo question for Dr. Hutton. Do you agree or disagree that the destruction of the second floor of the Long Barracks was, in part, a response to the temperance movement, given that the previous occupant had sold spirits from there? Defend your answer. Well, being opposed to the consumption, distribution, and sale of spirits, I, I, I guess that must be a good thing that, uh, I've never heard that argument before, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I think this is, uh, predates though World War I when there was so much anti-German hostility, although in Texas, German hostility uh, uh, predates uh, the late unpleasantness of the 20th century. Um, I, no, I'm sure it was torn down simply to uh, highlight the chapel and its glorious hump. Great question, though. Yeah. Here's okay. one that Kristen might want to take. Do you have any comments, because you're going to leave town tomorrow, do you have any comments regarding the irony of a symposium held in a historical building scheduled to become a parking lot? Is this a peculiarly Houston thing, or is it more widespread? Well, actually, I, I don't think anything I've seen and, and some of the impressions I've had since I've gotten here were, you know, a p particular Houston thing. I, I think you know, good intentions pave the road to heck. And a lot of battlefields fall into the good intentions category where, you know, incremental changes all seem to be very rational choices at the moment. They're just, you know, we, we need to do this for health and safety. We need to do this because there's a choke we need to enlarge this because there's more four-year-olds, you know, and nine-year-olds are falling off rocks, so we need fences. And, and that's how you end up with a lot of things in the battlefield that are all meant as good amenities that someone lobbied hard for. Even parking lots. Even parking lots that now make gravestones look like truck bumpers. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, uh, the... I'm sure nobody thought that when that was designed, but I actually took a picture and sent it around my office saying, what does this look like to you? Truck bumpers, you know. Uh, it's the kind of thing that I, I have a, you know, horrible moments video or a, a presentation I have for more insiders where, you know, we have battlefields in cages and battlefields now with headstones for truck bumpers, things that we'll show people and say, Lord, no, you don't want your battlefield to end up looking this way. It just requires a step back. And frankly, I'm a half full, glass half full kind of person. I look at San Jacinto and see all the cool possibilities and ask myself, why would anyone settle for less? Greg, did you have something? If you don't mind, I was going to revisit one of the questions to Douglas real quickly. Um, they Which ask about the cloth, sorry. the cloth, how do we know that that, that was Mexican army cloth? Um, I had the, uh, the, uh, the great privilege of discovering the Sea of Mud site and it was the great site about the, the great thing about the Sea of Mud site that it was, it was isolated. It was out in the middle of nowhere and pretty much everything we found, we knew it was Mexican army because it was the only army that ever got stuck in the mud in what's now Wharton County. So, and it was the only time the Mexican army was ever anywhere near there, so we knew it was 1836. San Jacinto, it's, it's, it's very period, we, the, the, but unfortunately there was a lot of activity <clears throat> in the park, the, the town of San Jacinto, and there was other sites and other things went on there. There was civil war activity in there. So when we find artifacts at San Jacinto, it's not near that, that, that clear. But the nice thing about the surrender site is it's very isolated. It's out in the middle of nowhere. You can't believe how hard it was for us to get in there. It was heavily brushed. It was terrible. And as far as we can tell, we call it the surrender site. I, I've said at the symposium three years ago, I, I would call it the disarmament site. I don't think that's where they surrender. I think that's where they disarmed. 
Then they marched out and surrendered. So we're finding basically 99% Texan and almost no, or I mean Mexican, and almost no trash at that area. I feel more comfortable that those artifacts were dropped by Mexican soldiers than just about any other th uh, of our archaeological finds. That's the purest, most isolated site that we find. It was almost like it was put in a time capsule for us, and it was just wonderful. Well, the last question will pick up on that complexity of the San Jacinto site. It asks uh, to expand briefly on the 19th century settlement that was at the Texian camp. Jeff, you want to take that? Uh, the, the town of San Jacinto was actually founded by Nathaniel Lynch, who operated the ferry, and he founded it in uh, uh, August of 1836. And he started selling lots uh, in the beginning of 1837, and then he died in February of 1837. But he had sold several lots. And uh, by the 1840s, uh, there were warehouses along the waterfront on Buffalo Bay. There was a sawmill there for a while. And uh, it was during the Civil War when we had some of that activity that I had mentioned about the uh, uh, gun factory there, gun repair facility. Uh, and the town appears on maps. You can see it on maps from the 1840s up to the 1860s and 70s. And then it got hit really hard. Eight, there's a major hurricane, 1875, hit it really hard. Uh, then another hurricane in 1886 uh, pretty much wiped it out. So uh, there were a few people still living there in the late um, uh, 1800s, including Ricardo de Zavala, who was the son of Lorenzo de Zavala. He actually had a house on the south side of Buffalo Bayou, and he actually corresponded with Henry McArdle when he was doing his famous painting of the Battle of San Jacinto. Uh, there's correspondence in the files uh, where Ricardo is sending him descriptions of the battlefield and even photographs of the battlefield from the 1890s. And then he died about uh, uh, 1901 or so, and uh, there really were very few structures in the 20th century at the site, but it pretty much is a ghost town today. David? That's my question. Uh, I thought I heard during a Douglas's presentation of something in the old Texan camp of the trees. We had that enumerated list of things. Yes. Uh, is, is, are you talking about the same? No. Okay. What was it that y'all kind of bumped into there on that? Well, we're, we're not precisely sure what it was because once we identified that it was uh, uh, mostly 19th, late 19th, early 20th century artifacts, we, uh, we were on a very focused project and we, we chose uh, with TPWD's agreement to um, not exactly bypass it, but not to, to continue focusing on, on the, the project at hand. Uh, hopefully at some point we or somebody else will be allowed to go back and, and do a more uh, detailed investigation of it's, that it's specific 430, site. It's 4.30, but David had a quick uh, statement. Of... I was going to just add a little more on the, the community of San Jacinto. Um, <laughs> it continued to function with, we're talking maybe 20 families, 12 families, 1900, which did a lot of damage to it, and by the end of the 1915, 19... September, the Galveston hurricane, September 19th, 1900. 1900. Pardon. Thank you very much. And the, 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 the last, I think it was only two houses left after the 1915 hurricane. We've got a couple of pictures of those. Most of them are out in the water now because of subsidence. So the community just never really got off the ground. They used the, uh, the St. Jacinto Cemetery for, for some of their burials. Uh, and I know I interviewed a couple of the people that used to live there. Let me thank you for your attendance, for your attention, for your questions. Uh, we hope to see you again next year. Thank you. <laughs>